Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another Signature Solar Roundtable. I'm Mason from Signature Solar. We're joined today by Josh McConnell from EG4. Today, we're here to talk about the EG4 batteries and answer some of the more common questions that we get about those batteries. So, Josh, thank you for being here. Absolutely. Um, before we dive into these questions, let's find out a little bit more about your background. What is your role over at EG4? So, I work in the R&D department, and I'm the battery quality assurance tech. Okay. Did you have a background working with batteries or with electronics before you came to EG4? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've been working on car audio for about 10 years. Okay. Installing subwoofers, some of the... Yes. The big yes. loud ones. Okay. Yes, sir. Awesome. Um, so these EG4 batteries are lithium ion phosphate batteries. Yes, okay. they are. We're seeing a big growth in that, in that market, mm -hmm. right, in that industry. Um, and seeing some people convert over from the typical lead acid batteries, correct? Yes, we, we, yes, we have been. Okay. Well, let's um, go ahead and dive into these questions. Um, our first question here, and we'll just kind of we'll answer these to the, the best of our abilities as we get them. Uh, question number one, what is the proper startup sequence for your batteries? And uh, kind of a, a second part of that question, do you turn them on before the inverters? So uh, I'll go ahead and say, you know, as a designer, there are battery startup procedures and protocols in the manuals. Uh, I know the Life Power 4 uh, and the V2, mm -hmm. but the, with different inverters, there can, can be some variances. Um, so uh, what's your recommendation on that startup procedure? Yeah, we always recommend um, going by the startup procedure of the inverter because that's what we're actually starting up, right, okay. is the inverter right. itself. Um, but thankfully, all of our batteries for the LLs and for the Life Power 4s, uh, they have pre-charged resistor braking circuits built into them. Um, and basically what that does is that safely charges the capacitors that, are, that will power on the inverter. Right, keeping too big of a current rush from yes. going into the inverter as it powers up. Right? Yes, exactly. It limits the inrush current that's, that goes into the um, inverter. And so you can have a safe startup for your inverter. Okay. So you've got to follow that protocol that's... Uh, that's laid out for the inverter then? Yes. yes, okay. yes sir. Um, second question here. How should I configure my dip switches? This is a great question. Um, your dip switches are going to be important for the closed loop protocol um, within your batteries, within your battery bank, whatever you're using. So we want to make sure that those are in the right position. Um, but there's going to be a little bit, bit different protocol on the dip switches between the Life Power 4 and the LL version, right? The yes. V2s. Yes, there is. Um, so the way they read binary, binary uh, numerical order is different between each battery. Um, the easiest way to, to do this is just to go ahead and, and to refer to the dip switch charts we've created. Um, it'll tell you the master configuration uh, for communicating with your inverter. It'll also tell you uh, your PC communication. Um, so always refer to the dip switch guide. It just keeps things very simple, especially if you start mix matching. Uh, different types of batteries to get right. And those switch guides in those manuals are very easy to read. I mean, they, they from battery, especially even with the V2, from battery one through battery 64. That's in your bank. It has the the dip switch protocol for all of those. Yes, it does. It's the safest way to go about setting your dip switches. Okay, um, let's go on to our third question here. Moving on, what size wire should I use to connect my battery bank to an inverter? Um, so as a system designer uh, myself, I know you're, whoever's designing your system, if you're having somebody design it, uh, especially if you're working with Signature Solar or a solar company that is go, kind of going through that process for you, your designer should have that answered. They should be able to size up that wire um, between your battery bank and your inverter. Um, but, you know, we deal with a lot of DIY customers, maybe some, some solar installers. Mm -hmm. So when you're talking about uh, wire gauge between those two, what do you recommend as far as finding out that size? So definitely go get a, get a manual for what, whatever inverter you're going to be using for your battery bank. Um, that's going to tell you your max charge and discharge on your DC side. And then from there, use an opacity chart. Uh, figure out how many feet, what gauge of wire you need um, that can safely handle the amount of current that your inverter will charge and discharge from okay. your battery bank. Yeah, charge and discharge. Yes, right? yes. You got some of those all-in-ones, that the all-in-one inverters now that will... Um, charge at a higher current right than they may discharge from y yes exactly mm -hmm. um, so always refer to your manual make sure you're putting high quality uh, ofc wire in there awesome okay moving on guys the next question why am i charging a 48 volt battery with a 54 volt or higher um charge voltage um, so i know these are called 48 volt batteries uh, realistically 
their nominal voltage is at 51.2 volts, mm -hmm. okay? But yes, uh, you are supposed to charge at a higher voltage than that. Uh, you're the expert, so I'll let you take over on that one about why you wanna be charging at that higher voltage. Yeah, so for these batteries right here for our 48 volt life power, um, we recommend bulk charging at about 56 volts. And the reason is because all batteries have internal resistance. So we need to charge at a higher nominal voltage than our, our pack voltage is right here. Um, that way we can uh, push amperage capacity and charge the cells. Okay. Um, next one here. Can I series my batteries to get higher voltage for boat motors, turbines, et cetera? So um, I understand this question. It's one we get quite a bit. Um, with people that have lead acid batteries, a lot of times they can charge those batteries mm -hmm. in series. They can run those batteries in series in their application. Um, not the case nope. with the lithium ion phosphates. Nope. Right, and that's, that's because of what? That's because we have a battery management system built into these batteries. Um, and all of their parameters are for their nominal voltage. For example, this 12 volt parameters um, they're all set for 12 volt to 14 volt, the parameters of this battery. Same thing with 48 volt battery. It's all set for the nominal voltage of the pack. So if you start putting things in series together, you could very well damage your BMS. Okay. They're not designed for that. Which is the whole, that's, that's the whole draw to these lithium ion phosphate batteries is that BMS system. Yes, you know, yes. Be able to have that. So if you're running the series and you damage that, then you're basically running um, the whole reason you wanted to make that transition in the first place. R right, exactly. They protect the cells. That's what the battery management system does. Okay. Um, next question we have here. Uh, this is a big one that we're seeing more and more. Will batteries work without closed loop communication? Right. So there's a big... Um, there's a big conversation right now, a lot of debate going on um, of whether it's worth it to make the transition to a closed loop protocol from an open loop uh, protocol, what the benefits might be, some of the pros and cons. Um, as far as the open loop and closed loop, uh, in your opinion, what, what do you think people are getting? Um, what benefits might there be to one and not the other? So there's definitely benefits to mainly only using closed loop. Okay. Um, the reason is, you now have your battery and your inverter communicating data packets between each other, depending if you would like to use RS-45 or CAN, that all depends on what your inverter can use. Um, you have a closed loop communication. It, it's a lot safer. Um, the state of charge, the inverter will know the state of charge. The inverter will know the battery's um, ambient temperature. It'll know its over discharge and overcharge protection parameters. So they start becoming a lot safer system. And with open loop, the only thing that your inverter knows is the voltage off your bus bar or off your terminal. Um, your inverter will just basically guess everything else. So if there's a problem with your battery, your inverter will never know it in open loop communication. So you basically, you have a chance to um, kind of significantly improve uh, safety and efficiency with the closed loop system because it's monitoring more aspects. Right? It's able to more accurately monitor than an open loop system can. Ab absolutely, closed loop is definitely the way to go. Right, okay, um, moving right along here. Can I wake up a battery that arrived with no charge? Okay, well, first of all, your battery shouldn't be arriving with no charge, all right? Um, in fact, they should never arrive with any less than 25% charge. Um, you should have at least two of these state of charge light batteries on the first time you know you turn on your battery. Um, that being said, um, things do happen. Uh, and, and if somebody does get a battery without any charge at, at arrival, mm -hmm. well, what do you suggest there? Um, so it depends on what type of charger you have. Um, if you bought an AC charger that was rated for the voltage of your battery, you can start charging there. Um, if you have an inverter that can do AC input or it could do PV, you can go ahead and start charging there also. Um, so even if the batteries are at 0% state of charge, you can still begin charging as long as you have a charger or an inverter that's ready to go. Yeah, I mean, and if it's a battery that arrives, you know, with no charge and you go through the process and you're talking with, you know, technicians and, mm -hmm. and you know, and, and help desk, customer service, it still has that warranty in place. Absolutely. You know, so at the end of the day, you know, it's going to be able to be made right. Absolutely. Okay. Um, big talking point here. What do I do if my batteries are reading different state of charge and different state of health? Okay, we see a lot of this question um, more and more coming in through the emails. We see it on some of the online forums, um, people talking about this debate. Um, so when you're talking about state of charge and state of health, 
I guess, you know, what's the, the, the biggest difference between state of charge and state of health, right? The state of charge is referring to it's capacity. Yes, like exactly. So it's the total capacity remaining. And then state of health is going to be the actual amp hours that are left, right? So state of charge will always, um, it'll always fluctuate. That's, that's you're using the battery, right? There's going to so, be some variance there. Absolutely. In a pack together, plus or five minus percent is okay. We can't expect every battery to be exactly the same state of charge. It's just not how batteries work in any chemistry. You put enough batteries together and parallel together, they will have a different state of charge. They're, there's a lot to it, mm -hmm. um, but it's okay to have a different state of charge as long as we're not off 10% state of charge, 20% state of charge, things of that nature. It's okay to see your pack be plus or minus 5% state of charge. Right, and it may sound you know elementary, but you also just want to make sure that your system's hooked up the right way. Absolutely. You want to make sure, you know, we get a lot of um, complaints and there's some, maybe some error messages sometimes, and it's a simple fix of making sure you followed your protocol, setting up your system, and your battery bank to a T. Um, sometimes we'll see just a missing wire or something hooked up the wrong way, and, and that'll fix the problem itself. So always start there, make sure that everything is wired up as specific and, and exactly the way it's supposed to be, um, you know, and then we'll focus on state of charge and state of health problems from there. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, getting towards the end of our question list here. How do I monitor batteries via Bluetooth? So we see a lot of um, battery companies, solar companies, basically uh, a lot of technology in general making this move to Bluetooth monitoring, mm -hmm. right? Having these Bluetooth aspects to their equipment, uh, to their electronics, just to make it easier, right? Where I don't have to stand at the, um, at the inverter, I don't have to stand at my battery to check that. Now I've got it in the palm of my hand and you know, I'm able to check it that way. Um, but for, our, for these batteries specifically, how do you monitor batteries and which ones have those Bluetooth capabilities? Yeah, so thankfully our uh, server rack batteries have started having Bluetooth, only 12 volt application right now. So the version two we have here does have Bluetooth um, and we also have an updated version one that has Bluetooth also. Um, so you need to go to the Signature Solar website. We have an iOS app and we have an Android app. Um, very easy to use. You install it on your phone. Um, it'll tell you state of charge. It'll tell you your. It'll you can see your battery cells. It'll tell you if your uh, battery is charging or discharging. Um, right. it's, it's a good little app to use. Okay. Um, last question: How do I do a BMS test? Right. Well, I, with 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 all the batteries, you're going to want to install the PC software and go from there. Correct. Yes. Install yes. the software and then what? Um, so we're, you're going to need a cable. Um, Thankfully for our two batteries, we're gonna use RS-485 to USB-A. Um, now there is two different programs to these batteries, just to stop the confusion if there was any. Um, our EG4LLs, they're gonna use BMS tools. We have that on the uh, EG4 website. Um, and we also have the LifePower 4, which is gonna use the uh, BMS test. Um, so each one of these programs are completely different, but they're gonna show you the same exact things. You'll be able to get more in depth in looking at your battery's data log, um, you'll be able to see your state of health, all your cells. Um, you'll get a lot more in-depth information than just reading the screen, for example, on this uh, version 212 volt. Awesome. Well, you know, that, um, that concludes our question list here. Uh, Josh, I want to thank you for joining us. Thank you all for tuning in and watching. I hope we answered um, some of these questions about your EG4 batteries. And we'll see you next time.